thanks everybody for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, for the September NDSU Extension Agribusiness Agricultural Market Situation Outlook webinar. Uh, glad you could make it after our hiatus, unplanned hiatus last month. Uh, got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to hand it right over to Brian Parman, Egg Finance Specialist. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave. So today I'm going to give the uh, presentation uh, that I was going to do before, but uh, we had to have a, a, hi a hiatus, as Dave said, a brief um, period of transition. And so today I'm going to talk about, I'm going to get my sh screen sharing going, uh, the USDA's land values report um, and uh, uh, some and the land values report that uh, we, we kind of put together and a little bit of comparison with that. And uh, uh, after that, um, Frayne Olson has a pre-recorded uh, webinar that he's doing for today that I'll be uh, uh, showing. He had a, a, another speaking engagement. He couldn't be here, but he, he did put a presentation together that we'll be showing uh, after mine. All right, so this is uh, the map that's put together by USDA. And this report comes out in August every year. And so the USDA does a national uh, cropland and pasture land price uh, change and, and then the price per acre of uh, every single state. So these are statewide. And you see up top, USDA came out and said in August that North Dakota's cropland prices were up 14.1%, uh, uh, so just over 14% uh, compared to 2021. Um, not the highest jump. Uh, that honor belongs to states like Iowa uh, and Nebraska up 21 and 20% apiece. So but certainly not the lowest. Um, so basically averaging statewide around $2,350 per acre for cropland as per their report. So a pretty big increase. Uh, pasture land values up as well, uh, as per the USDA's report, uh, North Dakota's almost to $1,000 an acre on average for pasture land. Right now, sitting around $930 per acre as a state. Uh, again, not, not some of the more expensive uh, that, that typically is in the southeast where the stocking rates are a lot higher and whatnot but pasture land prices uh, as per the usda's report coming up around 10.7 percent and so one of the things i want to say is I'll, the usda's uh report for north dakota and the one that we put out uh, comes from essentially the same data source but the way it's put together we put it into regions Okay, we take the counties and put it into regions and then and, and then it's weighted. It's a weighted average. So the weighting factor and the fact that we put it together in regions will show slight different a, a bit of a difference from what the USDA's value is. And it's and again, it's similar source, it's just the way it's put together. So one of the things, if we look at national average prices, uh, so here's pasture land values in the US 2008 through uh, uh, 2022. This 11.5% jump nationally is the biggest jump since 2013 to 2014. And if we recall that 2014 year is the year, you know, calves approached $3 a, a pound for feeder calves and bread heifers were super, you know, expensive, $2,500, in some cases, $3,000 uh, at, at auction in 2014. So that was a 10.3% jump. This year, though, or from last year to this year, 11.5%. Uh, the highest certainly in about the last uh, couple of decades for pasture land values. And then you look at cropland values nationally. Uh, the biggest jump prior to this year was that 2012 to 13. We remember that uh, uh, corn prices were up in that six to eight dollar uh, a bushel range, soybeans approaching, you know, 15 bucks, uh, wheat prices strong. Uh, that was a 13.7 percent jump 12 to 13. 21 to 22, 14.2%. So the largest uh, single year increase uh, in the last couple of decades for, for uh, uh, cropland as well. And one of the things that kind of facilitated this, when we look at net farm incomes from 2020 and 2021, uh, both years well above average, but not nearly as high as they were in the years that we had those big jump in cropland and pasture land values. Back when that happened in, you know, that, 11, 12, 13, 14 region, net cash farm income and uh, 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 net farm income were actually higher than, well above average, and higher than they were when adjusted for inflation uh, from even in 2021 and pro the projected number for 2022. So it's interesting to think 
that we had the, a much larger jump in land prices than we did. Well, I, I won't say much larger, but larger than we did before. And yet net farm incomes and net cash farm incomes were not nearly as high or not nearly as much above average uh, as they were back then. So a bigger jump, but lower net farm incomes and net cash incomes when adjusted for inflation. And so when we look at what we put out for North Dakota, we came up with 10.9% cropland prices statewide uh, increase. I'll just flip back real quick. The USDA said 14.1. And again, that's because ours is weighted. Okay, so what that essentially means is if a uh, tract of land, for instance, that's, let's say a section, you know, 600 plus acres or whatever of cropland sells, and you look at the price per acre, if you, and then, an, and then another area uh, field sells and it's 80 acres. And you say, well, this one was $5,000 an acre of the 600 or yeah, 600 acre field. And this 80 acre field was uh, $3,000 an acre. In some cases, you'll just take a simple average between the two. Well, when we weight it, we say that the 600 acre field has more weight and more impact on the average price across the state because it was more acres that sold, if that makes sense. So it, it, had, it carries more weight in when you calculate the average, hence the reason that we see some differences in what we calculate versus uh, the USDA's. But 10.9%, um, most expensive land again in the, in the state is South Red River Valley. Uh, approaching 5,000, 4,500 to 5,000 an acre, pretty much up across the board, North Valley, 3,400. This is kind of what we found. And you can find this report um, if you if you search through land values, North Dakota NDSU. This was put out in a news release if you want more detail on it. Statewide pasture land values up 11.5%. That was closer to the national average. Uh, you'll notice the grayed out areas. That's because there isn't much, much pasture land in the North Valley or the South Valley in the Northeast. But pretty much universally up across the board uh, in pasture land values as well. And one of the first times since I've been putting this together that that, that was actually seen. And what that implies is it's not just data noise. This, these land prices were, were indeed increased uh, from last year to this year. And it, it's 11.5% plus up across the board. You know, something definitely did happen. There was a big increase. So this, is put, this uh, chart is put together by uh, uh, Farm Bureau um, and using USDA data and uh, NAS data. And this is on rents. And you'll notice while land values were up double digits in terms of percentage change from 21 to 22, rents were not. Rents were closer for uh, cropland, whether irrigated or non-irrigated, around 5%, 45 to 5.5%. Pasture land rents up uh, considerably, up 7.5% almost. Now in North Dakota, we found virtually no difference in pasture land rental rates uh, from last year to this year. I believe a big reason for that was the big drought that we had. Uh, if there's not a lot of forage heading into 2022 because of last year's drought, it's awfully tough to ask for an increase in pasture land rents when, when there's not as much forage as available uh, compared to an average year because of the sub, uh, following the drought. So this may in fact increase more uh, this year that we got some water. But again, with pasture, you know, it can take more than a year to recover from a drought. And as a result, we we may have to see some increases uh, later on down the line as pasture land attempts to catch up with maybe where the market thinks it should be based on available forage. And then going to pasture land, uh, 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 cropland rents, I'm sorry, up 3.1% uh, versus uh, 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 an increase in um, land values. Uh, well over double digits. And, I, and the same thing with rents. Rents are virtually unchanged, but I already explained pasture land. Now, one of the things with cropland that's important to remember, when rental rates were being negotiated this last spring, uh, production costs were really high, especially with respect to fertilizer. And so when folks were thinking about what they're going to pay for rent, yes, commodity prices were high, but fertilizer you know, anhydrous was over $1,500 a ton and urea was approaching $1,000 a ton. Um, phosphorus price is high. Uh, potash price is effectively tripled and uh, machinery costs up. So as a result, uh, past, rents did not jump at the rate that uh, land prices did. The other thing was a lot of those programs that had happened in 2020 and then kind of residual into 21 as well as MFP, 
those were all paid out in cash. And so the cash reserves that were that some folks had that were floating around a little bit, a lot of that went into a land purchase that wouldn't necessarily be something that somebody would use to justify increasing rent. OK, it, it makes sense to use it for a purchase to these folks, but not to pay a higher rental rate. Hence, rental rates were a little bit muted as far as their their increase relative to values. And if we look at North Dakota's rental rate, um, cropland rental rate, it did increase again 2021 to 2022. But for the most part, it's been kind of steady from 15 all the way through 21 with a bit of an increase up getting up over 70 bucks an acre statewide. So the last portion I want to go over with this uh, uh, talking about land prices is what's going on with interest rates. So here's the 30 year fixed mortgage rate average in the US uh, going back to 2017. And these 30 year rates are approaching 6% now uh, for, for most loans. Okay, so I pulled this when, I, uh, when we were talking about doing this in August, this was the 30 year, uh, according to Freddie Mac, 30 year rate of mortgage was about 5.1%. Okay, so this was a month ago, approximately. 15 years, four and a half, and then five one arms at 4.4 uh, roughly. And so this was today. So 30 year went from 5.1 to 6% in a month. And then the 15 year increased uh, not quite a percentage point, but but quite a bit in the five one arm increased, you know, not quite a, a, a not quite a percentage point, but about five half a percent. So with the inflation information that came out um, at the end of August uh, it, the, through August with with the latest report, it was down slightly, but still historically high, still in that eight percent range. And this has caused the Federal Reserve uh, or a lot of folks believing that the Federal Reserve is going to continue to um, increase. Uh, the federal funds rate. And I just want to put it into his historical perspective. While 6%, if we go back here, 6%, 6% would be right here. Um, a lot higher than it's been. I mean, you got to go back to the mid 2000s roughly to see a, an interest rate as high, a mortgage rate as high as they are now. Uh, but in historical terms, still not all that high. I mean, basically you're at 6%, you're kind of where roughly the, the 90s um, and early parts of the, the 2000s. So the Federal Reserve tracks uh, what the market thinks that interest rates are going to be, okay? Uh, so in this case, the way to read this is that the uh, most folks think in the September meeting that interest rates, the federal funds rate uh, is going to go from its current two and a, two and a quarter to two and a half percent. That's the range it's in right now and go to to, to uh, 275 basis points or 300, which is 2.2 2 and three quarters to 3% or 3% to three and a quarter. Now this was pulled uh, last month. Now, if I go to today, because of the inflation report that came out, it, it shifted, everything shifted. Uh, and now 78% think it's gonna be in that three to three and a quarter and 22% are even now saying that it's three and a quarter to three and a half. So, and the reason I bring all that up is because I think that the increase in interest rates over uh, last year is going to halt some of the upward momentum that land prices have had, simply because borrowing is going to be more expensive. Um, folks are going to have to start really considering interest. You start getting in that six, seven, eight percent range. Uh, it's been a long, quite a while since anyone has had to finance anything at that rate. Uh, and so that's probably going to halt some of the upward momentum. Not only that, but you wonder how much of the cash that was that was received from some of these programs has already been spent and, and utilized on new land purchases already. Um, so I, I think I, I don't think it's going to go backwards. I don't think I'm not trying to say land prices are going to go down. And and I'm also not saying that they won't increase a bit. But I do think that we're probably not going to see a big massive jump from 22 to 23 or at least as big as we saw from 21 to 22 probably in the mid-ish mid-high single digits uh, would be my my expectation um, i would be surprised if it was much higher again because of the fact that a lot of purchases have already happened and because of uh, the increase in interest rates that anyone financing this uh, is going to going to encounter higher rates and the other fact is that uh, equipment costs have, have gone up pretty remarkably as well. I don't have any slides on that, 
But, you know, if folks are trying to decide do they need to trade off equipment and buy new, again, at higher interest rates to finance it, and the fact that those costs have gone up doesn't leave as much uh, available capital for uh, new land purchases. So with that, I believe we are doing the um, uh, question and answer at the end. So I'm going to stop my screen share real quick, and I am going to get ready to pull up uh, Frayne Olson's presentation. Um, here in just a second. Hello, I'm Frayne Olson, Crop Economist and Marketing Specialist with NDSU Extension. Today, I'm gonna to try and provide a brief overview of the information that we got in the September USDA WASD, the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, and kind of that the impact it's had then on the crop markets and also provide a brief, brief update on some of the new information we're getting about the uh, railroad union negotiations that are going on right now. Uh, before I begin, uh, again, I want to apologize for not being with you in person today. Um, I had a scheduling conflict, and so um, this is the best alternative was to try and record my presentation and then uh, provide it during our webinar. So again, if you have any questions or think of something later on that you'd like to ask or want to contact me, here's my contact information. I'd be happy to visit with you. So first, let's go to uh, the kind of the, the big buzz or big information that came out on Monday. This is the thing that impacted the markets the most. Uh, an update in the yield forecasts. Now, technically, USDA made small revisions downward, cut um, a small reduction in both planted and harvested acreage for both corn and soybeans, as well as a reduction in the yield. Now, the yield numbers captured most of the press uh, but the the uh, there was also some, some minor acreage reductions. So uh, let's just really quickly review the blue line on top is the average trade estimate. Um, again, a lot of the news companies will do a survey of, of the private forecasts and say, what do you expect to see in the report? And this really becomes the basis for comparison. So the blue line on top is what the trade was expecting to see, kind of what the average guess was. Um, we also, next line down is the highest trade estimate. Uh, the lowest trade estimate, and then what we got last month from the August WASD. The red line on the very bottom, of course, is the numbers that we did receive from the report. So let's let's kind of compare the, the blue line versus the red line. When we look at yield, the yield numbers were actually very, very close to what the trade was expecting. Um, uh, but the reduction, the kind of the surprise was the reduction in production, the total bushels produced, again, because of that minor adjustment in the, in the planted and acreage yield numbers. On the soybean side, that's really where the shock value was. So the trade was expecting a national average yield of about 51.5 as a forecast coming out of USDA. We actually got 50.5. Uh, a bushel drop in soybean yield is a pretty significant drop, and especially in one month period. Um, part of that, again, is it the, the reduction in production, when you look at the production numbers, was, was because of the planted acreage, but a large portion of that was because of the yield numbers. So again, we want to make sure that we understand what did USDA do, what it was the change this month from what they had previously. Obviously, another month worth of information has transpired. We got a better idea from a sampling standpoint what that crop might look like. But in September, the September report, USDA relies on farmer survey information. They survey farmers and say, what do you expect to see on your farm? They use satellite imagery or what they call remote sensing to try and also estimate and get a better picture on a larger scale of what's happening. But in September, for both corn and soybeans, they also uh, hire enumerators. They hire people to actually go out into randomly chosen fields and do spot checks. They actually do yield estimates very similar to what a crop insurance adjuster would do. So they combine the information from these three sources to try and come up with what would they expect to see for a national average yield. So again, as we move through time, we're gonna get better and better information, probably more reliable forecasts. I do think one of the reasons, in my personal opinion, one of the reasons that both corn and soybean yields dropped as far as they did, especially soybean yields, is because of some of the drier conditions in the Western Corn Belt, in particular, Nebraska, South Dakota, parts of Southern Minnesota and parts of Western Iowa. It's not that they're gonna have major yield drops, but I do think because of the drier conditions, the test weights might be showing up a little bit lighter than what we had first expected. So when we translate that into what does that mean for bottom line, when we, when we try and forecast or predict 
how much grain are we going to have in reserve at the end of the marketing year? So about 12 months from now. Um, the red line on the bottom is the information that we got in the report on Monday. The blue line on top is what the trade was expecting to see. Now, as USDA cuts their production numbers, they have to make some adjustments in the usage numbers, the consumption numbers. Now, there were very little changes in the wheat balance sheet. There was a few minor adjustments, but very small changes. On the corn side, there were, some, again, some minor reductions because we saw some changes in the, in the production side. So again, we don't have as many bushels. We expect prices to go up to help ration that usage a little bit. Most of the change was a small reduction in feed, the forecast for feed consumption, and a small reduction in ethanol. But again, relatively minor changes. The big shift, of course, was on the soybean side. So the reductions in soybeans, almost all of, not quite, but almost all of those reductions came in the form of reduced forecast for exports. So right now, the current forecast is that the domestic crushing will be larger than um, our export values. Last month, they were about equal. So almost all of this reduction in, in yield and capacity has come at the expense of our exports and export possibilities. At least again, that's the current forecast. So I wanna shift back into the, the yield information just a little bit to again, put, put things in perspective for everybody. So the red line that bounces around is the national average yield going back historically from 1991 through 2001. That's the time period that USDA uses typically about a 30 year time period to project at this trend line yield, which is the blue line. So think about the trend line yield as the average yield that we've seen in the US adjusted for technology for essentially better farming practices. So really what we're looking at is think about the, the blue line as average and then the red line being the actual forecast, especially the dot on the far dotted line on the far right hand side. So based on what we know today and the, the current forecast expectations coming out of USDA's pr projections, we're looking at slightly below average yield. Nothing dramatic, very similar to what we saw in 2019 as far as a differential between what we what the average and what we actually received, but nowhere near the kind of reduction we saw back in 2012, which is that large V that you see. So yes, it's gonna be a little bit, yields are gonna be a little bit lower than average, but not really a train wreck. All right, let's shift to soybeans. So for a long time now, we've been looking at a trend line for soybeans above average. And the, the current forecasts now have basically brought us down to that average. So that, that USDA forecast of about 50.5 bushels is really about trend line. So we're looking at kind of an average soybean year. Again, we'll wait to see how the weather progresses and what kind of, of harvest yields we get as we move into the, the combines running in the field, we get some verification. But right now, this is kind of the numbers that the trade is looking for. So what does that mean for crop pricing? Um, and I pulled these charts about eight o'clock this morning. So it was during that break, that overnight between the overnight trade and the, and the day trade. So this is really before the day trade started, gives you a general idea of kind of what's happening. Now for corn, we've seen a general uptrend, a general upward movement in corn prices since you know about July um, when we started looking at that there were areas in the core corn belt, in particular the Western corn belt, that was starting to have some troubles. So we are seeing some bouncing around. There's some daily volatility, but in general, our prices have been coming back up, not nearly at the levels that we saw this last spring. I really don't, my personal opinion, I don't expect them to get back to those levels because a lot of that high price that we saw at that point was because of the risk premium due to delayed planting and some weather issues. So we are in the, that range right now coming into harvest where we have some very strong pricing uh, coming into the harvest time period. When we look at soybeans, a lot more volatility. It, it's still a general uptrend. If you were to draw a trend line, you know, I would probably start down here and move a trend line upward diagonally, but it's kind of a weak trend line. I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on it. So one way of thinking about it is we also kind of have this really wide trading range. And I do think we'll be bouncing around within that trading range. I think soybeans, in my opinion, will have the most price volatility. So when we see day-to-day -day movements upwards and downwards uh, or, or weekly movements, I think soybeans will be kind of the leader on that front because our, our ending stocks are the tightest. 
And there's some um, new information now coming into the marketplace about what might be happening in South America and the size of the South American crop, which I'll talk about in, in some of our future webinars. For wheat, especially for spring wheat, we've been kind of in this trading range between about 860 and about 960 for you know, most of the summer. Um, and I, my opinion, again, I don't think we're going to really break out of that trading range until either we get through the end of corn harvest or if we start to hear some things that might change this, the um, kind of the psychology in the corn market. So I think for the next probably a couple months, we're going to see wheat, the wheat complex, not just spring wheat, but also the wheat complex kind of follow what's going on in corn. Now, there are some wild cards. Obviously, something that happens in Russia, Ukraine can make a difference as well. But right now, kind of shorter term, the, the things on the horizon that might change the psychology or opinions of the marketplace, I think are really going to be driven by the corn market. Some last final comments, just a brief update on what we've learned so far about the, the uh, contract negotiations between the unions, uh, the railway unions and the railroad. Um, I'm just going to read these off and try and provide some context. So as of this morning, we have a tentative agreement. Now, this is a verbal agreement, kind of a handshake thing between the major railroads, including UP, Union Pacific, BNSF, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, CSX, Norfolk Southern, and Kansas City Southern Railroad. So those all those are big class one railroads. There are three unions that represent about 115,000 workers that were under negotiation. And there was this Friday at uh, one minute past midnight deadline that, that everybody had for coming to some kind of resolution. Well, because of a very long marathon sessions of negotiation, there is a tentative agreement now to bring back to the union members for approval. So even though that the union leaders and the railroads have kind of agreed in principle, the union members still have to vote on this and, and, and to finalize it, to have to actually confirm it. Now, if the union votes fail, so let's, you know, worst case scenario, this thing fails, and we got to go back and, and kind of reconsider, there's still another cooling off period. We don't know the exact length. It's usually two to three weeks in length because when, when these kind of tentative agreements are put in place, the, the, the terms of that usually have some kind of cooling off period to allow not only time for the voting, but then if there's any kind of adjustments or refinements they need to make to get approval from the union members, they have time to do that without being under pressure for additional strikes. So just because one of the unions or several of the unions have reject this, there is still time um, to be able to work through some of those negotiations. So the moral of the story is this Friday deadline, this Friday at one minute past midnight on Friday for a, a, a shutdown, either a possible strike by the unions or a lockout by the railroads has been removed. So that we've, we've got a couple more weeks now to see if we can get this resolved and hopefully keep the system running. Just again, a little bit more context. These negotiations have really been going on for about two years. Uh, there's 12 different railroad unions that, that were negotiating with the Class 1 railways. Nine of them already have contracts in place. They've been able to renegotiate those contracts and have them in place. There were three, and these were relatively large unions, that were still kind of in negotiations or weren't able to come to some kind of agreement. And the thing that made everybody concerned was, okay, what does this do to rail shipments in particular as we're coming into harvest, the, the corn and soybean harvest? And Norfolk Southern had actually announced that they were going to halt unit train shipments of bulk commodities like, like grain, like coal today. Uh, but again, that now has all been put on put on hold. That's been, that's been kind of sidelined. Uh, we're in the, in the process now of kind of waiting to see what the unions were doing. One more little piece of background information. So if there is no agreement, if, if again, we wait these couple of weeks, there's no agreement, there's still three possible outcomes. So the parties can still negotiate and keep everything going without any kind of a strike by the unions or lockout by the railways. Um, the unions could strike or the railroads could lock out the workers, which again would really come to a screeching halt. Or Congress can intervene to either mandate extended talks or actually establish an agreement. Now, again, Congress is relatively slow unless they're really, really pushed to do something and then they can move care very quickly if necessary. So these are kind of the fallback positions if agreements aren't made. 
my personal opinion is I think we're going to get to an agreement just because the political as well as the economic impacts for not having some kind of an agreement are just far too large. They're just far too extensive. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Um, again, I appreciate your patience. If you do have any more questions, feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to stop sharing, and as you can see, uh, Frain isn't available for the for the questions um, this uh, uh, this this webinar. So our next speaker is Tim, who is uh, going to be talking about livestock. And with that, I think I've shut off my screen sharing. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I wish I had an hour to talk to you because there's so much going on in the of livestock with all the different market classes and so on. And, and, uh, and I'm just going to get some highlights from cattle. And uh, to start off with weather, here's the, which is really, really important for cattle and uh, has both short and long, long run implications that we'll see in a minute. This is the drop monitor day. Basically, you see west of the Mississippi River a lot of drought, and particularly in cattle country. And uh, again, the drought has passed a lot of things. Even up here in North Dakota, for most of the summer, we were okay, but uh, we're abnormally dry in most of the state now, with even some D1 setting in. But man, you know, compared to last year, the southern plains are dry in the whole west. On the bottom there, uh, the dark green are major cow calf areas, and the lighter green, more, more minor ones, is on a county basis. But then the red, a drought overlaid on top of that. So the important thing is in the purple circle down on the bottom left hand side, 55% of our beef cow herd is an area of drought. And so that has you know, a lot of ramifications, particularly in the southern plains where it's so dry. We've had early movement of the calves and we're forced liquidating cows. We, North Dakota, we uh, probably didn't force liquidate many cows uh, this year because. Uh, you know, thank goodness we had rain and, and, and we had pasture. But from the overall U.S. situation, uh, beef cow slaughter uh, so far this year is up almost 14 percent. And last year it was up 9 percent. And so that has a lot of ramifications as we'll see next year. So this uh, slide I was actually going to show you last time the report came out towards the end of July. But this is the... Uh, July 1st inventory report. USDA does two inventory reports a year, January 1st and January 1st report is much more in depth state by state and the July one is only uh, for the US, but uh, uh, gives us some kind of mid-year picture of what we can expect for the rest of the year and, and beef production and so on. So a couple of key points, we did go down again this year. So this is the fourth year of liquidation of our beef cow herd. On July 1st, uh, we had about 30.35 million beef cows. And I think, you know, uh, Brian earlier in his talk mentioned back at that 2014 time period when we had record high cattle prices and what happened to rents and, and so on. So we're, uh, our, our low point in beef cow numbers cyclically, you know, for a long time here, was back in 2014 when we had 29.75 million on July 1st of 14, and uh, and we're down to 30.35 and that now and you know just above that and so you know that's certainly going to be supportive to prices in the future and then the big question mark is what's going to happen next year and that all depends on weather and of course we still got a lot of uh, drought and we're hoping for more rain and so on. Uh, you know, the, the last cycle back there in 2010, 11, uh, 12, a, in the 13, 13 admission, because the report was severe southern plains drought, and now it's setting up similar to what it was back then. And so that's one of the reasons why we had those record high prices. But we're getting down close to those numbers. And it doesn't look like we're going to rebuild uh, next year. On the bottom, our heifers held as beef cow replacements. And so you see there, way in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, our, uh, as of July 1st, were what uh, producers in the U.S. intended to keep for, for beef power replacements. And that's the lowest number since we started keeping July 1st replacement heifer records in 1973. 
So you've got a lot fewer replacement heifers, and it's still dry, and so the likelihood, well, by, for sure by the January report, we will be down again. And again, uh, very supportive to the price. So uh, where are all those heifers? Obviously, uh, they're not replacement heifers, so we send them into the feed yards. And so a lot of questions I'm getting is why can cattle on feed numbers stay relatively high when, you know, similar to last year and even history, when we've got a smaller cow herd every year? And the answer to that is, well, it's twofold. One, the drought is forcing lighter weight cattle in in the southern plains and the feedlots lighter than they would have stayed on grass, which is deeper. And then the other big thing is we've got the most on a percentage basis heifers uh, on a percentage of total cattle on feed, the highest percentage of heifers that we had on this chart all the way back to 2010. So all those heifers in the feed yard, it means more beef now. Uh, so that's a holding prices a little bit on the fed cattle side, but into the future, it's even more price supportive because, uh, you know, we're killing them and instead of putting them in another. So, uh, got some more questions, so I thought I'd just quickly get this on why the big uh, difference in, in calf prices in the southern plains versus the northern plains. And again, these are average prices for the northern plains. So it's Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, and Minnesota in there where, uh, you know, prices are higher in Nebraska and South Dakota. And here's, so these would be higher than North Dakota, which is the northern plains. And then compare that on the bottom to the Southern Plains, which is the Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, and those big states down there. So yeah, you see uh, a $26 difference for, from uh, at least from the USDA standpoint, the same weight and grade of calves. And again, drought is part of that. And, 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 the, and they always are lower in the Southern Plains than up here, but it's, it's intensified by the drought and they're selling a lot of calves down there and actually in North Dakota, we really haven't started selling many calves yet, but they're always lower too because there is kind of a quality issue down there. And then corn is usually higher down there in the Southern Plains because their deficit, you might have a, a, a positive 50 cent to even in some extreme cases, depends on a dollar plus basis when, when typically we would have a negative basis up here. So corn might be a dollar or more higher down there, affects their feeder cattle prices. And uh, so uh, those are all things there, but it, it's, it's quite a big difference and, uh, than, than in normal, and, and that's the reason, drought plus the other reason. So let's just go to the uh, prices here uh, by market class and move along. Here's Fed steer prices. Again, the two most important things that affect feeder cattle prices are Fed steer prices and corn. I'll just end up a little bit on uh, corn there, but. You know, we're uh, the, that cyclically declining cow herd is definitely showing up on fed steer prices. Kind of interesting on uh, on uh, beef production. Actually, we have record beef production uh, this year, and uh, of course, it's intensified by the, the big cow kill we have as well. But we've got record beef production, and yet our prices are quite a bit higher than they were uh, last year, last year at this time about 125 and we're, you know, on the average 143 or higher in the Northern Plains than that, but again, this is the U.S. average. So, you know, we're uh, 20 dollars higher there and and uh, and uh, even though beef production is record high, but we are having fewer numbers and demand is, I'll hit that in a minute too, is, is holding there. And so we uh, expect prices to continue up, but at least the futures there, those red squares, uh, you know, to, to uh, up to 150 by the end of the year. And then next year, again, with that uh, declining cow herd and beef production is going to fall off next year, quite likely, because we can't uh, maintain the level, of at least how that we have now, and we will have less. So by next year, probably, you know, close to a 155 average going across there, at least based on the futures market, and that's kind of what USC is expecting. So there are better times, that, you know, price supportive because of, of supplies for sure going on there. And uh, one of the, you know, talking about demand, are in spite of pretty high prices, 
There, the uh, domestic demand has held uh, fairly good, but uh, kind of interesting uh, on the on the export side. Uh, well, last year was a record year for beef exports, and this year we're going to have another record year for exports. We're always a couple of months behind the July numbers here. Just came out last week, and 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 again, you see the red line there uh, is always what I use for the for the current on those previous charts, and here we're above last year and expect that to continue. And, uh, just kind of a caveat there, you know, one of the reasons why we have record exports is since uh, the phase one agreement, China has moved from basically uh, taking no beef from us to now in the last year or so, they're our third best customer. And again, uh, you know, with their geopolitical things going on, uh, China and Taiwan are kind of a hot spot. So, you know, in order to keep those exports high next year and, and those cattle futures for the are, we need to keep our exports going. And so that would be kind of the thing to, to watch. And we go to our calf prices again. Uh, you know, here's what they've done this year, significantly higher than last year. But, uh, you know, we're going to have them um, close to a million less calves this fall to sell. And so the lower numbers are certainly supportive, even though we've been uh, selling in the southern plains and and uh, you know as Brian said you know back in 2014 we were still you know seventy dollars eighty dollars higher than this so they are record levels but quite a bit higher than last year uh, just a, a you know kind of an expectation here you see that purple uh, arrow down there and usually in the middle of October the last three years packed and you know, the the uh, the 2018 aren't on here because they have too many lines, but they were there. The low for the year there was October 15, too. So, you know, we do as the big run hits, and again, we, we aren't selling hardly any calves yet, but in another month, you know, the yearling sales are just heavily starting now for the next month or so. And I just kind of uh, keep that in mind is right there in mid October. So, we're going to see we can put by far, you know, we'll be supported. At, uh, at prices higher than, uh, unless there's some significant event higher than last year, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, 190 to 200 for sure support, maybe higher than that, it just kind of depends on how far it goes there. So, for, you know, the, the smaller power is definitely showing up on cap prices. Then we go to the yearling prices, kind of the, the uh, same story there. You see, uh, um, uh, um, increase and in, in higher than last year, and again a, on a year on year basis, the, the futures are uh, kind of struggling there. Uh, some with corn and so on, and, and we've had a, quite a positive basis this year over the futures, and, and we're seeing that now. You know, with the uh, September futures, they're around 180, but we're about ten dollars higher than that. That's kind of been the, all year and. Again, it's just kind of a signal, you know, uh, you know, we, we've got the higher quality cattle up here as well, and we're getting short, and, and so that uh, that gives us price support up here. And again, the big thing I think we're looking more long-term than are those gold uh, squares on the top. That's the futures market uh, for next year, again, with a smaller supply. So uh, Stand up here. Corn, uh, the corn is the other part of the picture in feeder cattle prices, and you know we're going to continue to see uh, volatile uh, uh, prices. I think, particularly in the futures market, and Frame covered this in detail. The green line there is corn, and he talked about that. But you see that opposite relationship between feeder cattle futures and corn. I have November feeder cattle out of the black there and the, the, the dashed uh, lines there and then the solid green line is corn. He showed you the these futures that was high in May and down but now they've improved. And so you, you know just go back to May there when we had you know $192 feeder cattle futures when corn was down here about 580 and then the opposite as as uh, corn went down feeder cattle went back up there with, you know just 191 back in mid-August, but then uh, corn going up down again. And even, you know, just just this week, Frayne mentioned that, but on Monday the USDA report uh, came out, we were up there 
uh, you know, 186, 83 on Friday, Monday, then they dropped off $2 after the report come out, and, you know, the report didn't come out at 11 o'clock, so we didn't have a lot of time there, and then again on Tuesday, they're down again hard with that corn, but then, you know, uh, you know uh, yesterday and even today now, today's is not here, but this is yesterday's corn fell off, so then that allowed Peter Kettle to come up. The last I looked, the same thing. Corn was was off a little bit today, and so particularly the distant feeder cattle. So you see that opposite relationship. So again, we're going to have to watch corn. So that's kind of my end of mine, and we're going to turn it over to Ron. Um, I am going to talk uh, today a little bit about the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. You probably heard about this on the news. Um, uh, it's, uh, a lot of controversy on the name. Is it really going to help inflation? Most economists say, well, it could a little bit, but pr probably it was just a good, uh, a good title to use. Um, there is a lot of things in this bill. Things, a, lot, a lot of things are gonna be ironed out yet. Uh, I'm just gonna touch on some of the highlights. As the agencies uh, get, get this uh, bill and they'll, they'll, they, they will uh, adjust and, and do, their, do their thing and some of these numbers may change, but here's a few of the highlights. Um, there's uh, the projection of 400 billion in tax, uh, getting extra tax income from uh, putting a minimum 15% tax on corporations over a billion dollars, um, spending for 369 billion in climate change, um, uh, projections of, a, uh, of reducing the budget, uh, the deficit by um, by uh, 300 billion, um, uh, also. Uh, ho hopefully, um, getting uh, getting uh, income from price uh, price reform uh, on drugs. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, it also extends the uh, uh, the uh, the health care subsidies for three years. Those were put in during the pandemic. And uh, actually, if a person wanted health insurance and went on the exchange right now, it's very reasonable health insurance. And if those subsidies go away, things would look a lot different. Uh, there is money also for the drought, uh, for drought relief in, in, in the Western states. Um, first of all, the healthcare part. Uh, Medicare, um, uh, this was, they've been trying to do this for years and years and years, and, and uh, there's a lot of pressure from the pharmaceutical industry. And, uh, but they, do, uh, they are gonna allow uh, Medicare to negotiate drug prices, but it's only certain drugs and it really won't start till 2026, okay? And then the big thing here was the, the insulin. And of course, we know this, the diabetes has gotten to be a real problem in the, in the nation. And uh, for Medicare, these are for, it's for Medicare participants only. At one time, it was for anybody taking insulin, uh, but they, in the compromise of the bill, it's, it ended up $35 per month max just for Medicare participants. Out of pocket uh, capped at two thousand uh, uh, for the Medicare participants starting in twenty twenty five. It also sends. It also, as I mentioned, extends the the Affordable Care Act subsidies for three years. Now the IRS funding um, about eighty billion going to the IRS. Um, this is not. This is just uh, uh, some new spending. It's not to replace the normal budget for the IRS. OK, and the funding is to remain available through the end of 2031. And there won't be 87,000 new IRS agents with assault rifles going after you. Um, here's the breakdown of, of, of how it's how it's uh, shaking out here. Um, there will be quite a bit of money for enforcement. Um, so that's where they're, the, the, there's an assumption that they will collect some more tax revenue because that because of that. There will be money going to operations support uh, for taxpayer services. A lot of people complain about the services in, uh, at the IRS, and, and uh, so they're getting some more money there. And also their systems, uh, some of their systems are very outdated. They're very in need of updating some of their, their systems. Some of their systems are pretty modern, but a lot of them are very outdated, so there'll be money going for that. So that's kind of the breakdown of the IRS funding. Um, as far as the climate and energy goes, uh, it, it, it uh, extends or increases many of the renewable and zero emission credits, including incentives for nuclear. 
Um, it, it extends the biofuel credits and create a, creates a su uh, sustainable aviation fuel credit. Uh, there's a clean hydrogen credit. It extends and increases the efficient home energy credits. And Dr. Ripplinger may expand on some of these in, in a later session on some of these uh, energy issues here. Um, as far as the uh, electric vehicle credits, um, uh, many of the many of the provisions were, were, were expect to go into effect after the end of the year, and will and will hopefully stay in 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 effect until 2020 through to uh, 2032, unless Congress changes it. We get a new Congress. You never know what happens. Um, and for electric vehicles, it's it's uh, remains at 7,500 tax credit at the point of sale. There's also up to four. Uh, for a uh, four thousand dollar credit for used uh, vehicles, and it also removed that cap on on manufacturers if they sold two hundred thousand vehicles, uh, uh, so they can sell more vehicles and still have the credit. Um, in the go in negotiation for the bill, Senator Kristen Sim uh, Simina of uh, Arizona, uh, they, they had they had removed the carry carry carried interest loophole. But she compromised. They, the, in order to get her to go for the bill, they put that loophole back in, and in exchange, they they created some exem some exemptions for uh, depreciation deductions, and they had this. They added a one percent stock buyback excise tax, and I'm not sure exactly what that's all about, but but that's supposed to generate some money and kind of offset the carried interest. Now, for those of you who don't know what a carried carried interest is, it's actually a loophole that that, that uh, um, people that manage equity and, and, and equity accounts and, and uh, investment accounts, uh, not retirement accounts, but other, other non-retirement accounts, they, uh, they, when they get their compensation, it's based on a percentage and they get paid, uh, they get paid uh, uh, at a lower capital gains rate. And there's a lot, there has been a lot of controversy on that. Uh, should they get that loophole tax break, but that's back in. It, uh, on this bill. Um, Senator Joe Manchin, West uh, Virginia, uh, uh, the demands, uh, he, he demanded that uh, there should be some cut to the deficit. So basically uh, the revenue uh, from stricter enforcement of the IRS, uh, the IRS rules and the, and the more, and the more, uh, more uh, agents to enforce the rules would uh, bank that up. Also because of negotiating a Medicare uh, it would it would reduce uh, it would uh, make that a little cheaper, so that would generate some some revenue. Um, uh, and they also uh, they also for the IRS um, they they for the new enforcement uh, anybody anybody earning less than four hundred thousand dollars they weren't going to have a a bigger percentage of audits. For that, for those incomes, most of the enforcement and the higher and the higher audit percentage would probably be to the higher taxpayers, higher income taxpayers. Now, the egg funding. There was some egg funding that was thrown in here, and this is what I'm going to concentrate on: about 44 billion, uh, 19 billion for a uh, 19.5 for farm bill conservation programs, 13.3 for rural development, six billion for FSA uh, farm loans and uh, five billion for forestry. And here's how it breaks down, about 45% then is for conservation and the next biggest percentage is for, uh, for the rural development. Um, I'll quickly go through these charts. Uh, the, as you can see here, it, it doesn't all happen all just in one year. Uh, most of it, the rural development comes right away but some of the some of the conservation type programs will be spread out over year, over the years as um, uh, as uh, as well as the the uh, a little bit of rural development gets spread out over the years. But but so, so it kind of breaks down based on year. Um, here's the percentages uh, for the conservation program and all those acronyms there: the Equip program, the con Conservation Stewardship Program, and most of it actually goes to the Equip program, about 43%. And they have the the, the Ag Conservation e Easement Program there. That would be the one that's in kind of the yellow color. And then Technical Assistance and other just is about 7%. And that's how the conservation money breaks down. Um, as far as the rural development, 
a lot of it, a lot of it goes to rural electric co-ops, probably for maybe be uh, upgrading the, the grid to some, to some point. Uh, and there's re renewable energy loans. The, the, the rural, rural energy, I was trying to remember the rural energy, what was that acronym? I got my notes here. Uh, the Rural Energy for America, that's a, a per program. There's money for that. And uh, so anyway, most of that is, is up front uh, in 2022 and 23. Uh, for FSA, uh, they've got some administrative money there. Uh, most of it goes for distressed borrower assistance or discriminated F FSA borrowers, okay? For forestry, um, some administration there, uh, national forest system, state and other governments get money regarding that. So break, breaking it down here on the conservation easements, uh, about 4.5 billion over the uh, in budget authority, uh, uh, plus another 1.4 billion in budget authority. Mainly going to focus on uh, on uh, uh, re reducing or avoiding uh, uh, reducing carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide emissions, and then the and then the um, the rural. Conservation Partnership Program (RCPP). Um, there again, five, uh, three billion plus four point nine five billion, and then that's going to mainly focus on soil carbon improvement, reduce nitrogen losses, and uh, so and reduce and and reduce uh, uh, carbon dioxide and methane. So there are a lot a lot of conservation in, in uh, uh, program in in this bill. So with that, I will stop and I'll answer questions at the end and I'll turn it over to Dr. Ripplinger. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk just briefly about uh, some things that are going on in Europe and how it impacts US agriculture. Uh, we've already experienced this for the last 12 months in the form of higher fertilizer prices. Uh, that and other issues are likely to persist and I, I thought that would be worthwhile to cover at least briefly uh, this week. Uh, so uh, we're all familiar, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine uh, earlier this year, a little over six months ago. Uh, things did not go as planned um, in many respects for Russia or for the West. Uh, everyone was expecting a quick resolution, um, but that's not what happened. Uh, the, the real expectation was that Russia would be able to uh, achieve their goals in short order with, with little to no Western involvement. Uh, basically because there'd be a lack of time to respond, again, being over within a few short weeks. And also because in some respects, uh, Europe's hands were tied or they were you know, limited, at least in thought, due to their reliance on Russian energy, specifically natural gas, but also oil. Um, you know, that's certainly not what happened. Covering things we already know, both Ukraine and Russia are major exporters of a variety of grains and oil seeds, talk specifically about weakness chart, um, Basically, you know, they, they play a critical role uh, in, in providing food to, to much of the world. Um, same thing for, for, for fertilizers, fo focusing specifically on nitrogen fertilizer, uh, because it is almost entirely made of natural gas uh, around the world. Um, Russia both produces a lot of natural gas as well as nitrogen fertilizer, including in urea, which this chart shows of. And again, you can see that they're 14% of, of global uh, urea exports uh, in recent years. Uh, now here's kind of getting cut into the chase. Um, natural gas prices. So I actually converted these. These are for the Netherlands uh, natural gas contract. Um, picked this up earlier this week. Basically what we see is their price again. So this would be the same measures we'd have here in the United States. So US dollars per MMBTU. Uh, but we've seen you know, in, in just a little over the last year is prices increasing more than tenfold. Uh, and they still persist at that level and that's uh, wrecking havoc on industry. And again, it's, it's a signal um, to a variety of folks of what they need to do. Again, they're, they're tremendously short natural gas and they're trying to figure out how to prepare for that, how to ration and the like. Um, looking forward, uh, you know, we're expecting natural gas prices in Europe. So this is taken on Monday. So this is the forward curve. So basically all of the, the upcoming futures contracts month, that price taken on, on Monday morning, again, for these prices to persist, you know, at, at even $25 per decatherm, you know, three, four years from now. And this is three times what it is in the United States. And the reason it's, 
it's that the United States price has followed this to some extent is because we have been exporting liquefied natural gas uh, to Europe and we're balancing things out. But again, right now, the price of natural gas in Europe is is about eight times what it is in the United States and about 20 times of what it might be in, in, a, in an average or normal period in the United States uh, w- with the ex- exception of what's going on. And again, if you think about natural gas and the role it plays in heating, uh, processing and the like power generation, it's, it's really a big deal, particularly to Europe. But again, it extends to us, especially when we think about fertilizer. Uh, one thing just to note, uh, food security, energy security is this idea that you have both physical access and the ability to pay for food or energy. Uh, Europe is, uh, the United States is really the only food and energy secure country in the world. Uh, the exception that might be Russia. Um, but the idea here is that, you know, Europe was really put in a spot prior to the war and is still in a spot coming into this next winter. Um, and now we're starting to hear what the EU as a whole is planning for winter as, as well as additional plans uh, for individual countries. Uh, caps on revenue for those who, in the utility business, taxes on any windfall profits, uh, direct subsidies to households for heating and possibly for power. Uh, rationing, so specific limitations on how much power different users can can use in the next six months, and then also lines of credit to make to make sure there's liquidity in the markets. Um, kind of a joke here, but things are serious. Kind of the uh, first story in in what's going on. So we're starting to see agribusinesses shut down, processes shut down. In this case, it's it's a Polish brewery um, which is shut down uh, when you can bottle. A typical practice is you put a little CO2 in the top, and if you don't have that CO2 to finish that bottling process, you don't do it. So this this Carlsberg Polska has stopped brewing beer. Um, other brewers to follow suit. Again, this is it's kind of funny, but it's also semi serious because when you start messing with the food supply, uh, national stability actually does come into question. I'm just looking at what this means for agriculture, focusing first on Europe, but then we can just naturally think what it means for the United States. Uh, we, we're seeing a lot of fertilizer plants shut down. A CF in, in, in Great Britain actually shut down last year about this time because of high natural gas prices and poor margins. As of right now, we have more than a fourth of the EU's nitrogen fertilizer production capacity uh, currently mothballed. And we don't know exactly when they're going to come back. Uh, looking towards the winter, there's a lot of concern that there will not be power or natural gas for heat for a variety of food manufacturers, including millers and bakers, dairy processors, vegetable processors and the like. Um, one thing to note is that right now that the story uh, coming from Europe uh, and from the financial sector is that Europe has enough natural gas to get through the winter to provide heat to households, period, hard stop. You have a cold winter, they're short. If you actually wanna use some of this for industry or power generation, they're in trouble. Um, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, one of the questions I have kind of longer term is first we're seeing a shutdown, but also I think that there's implications for the, the siting of future agribusinesses, food manufacturers. I can't imagine why anyone would be really excited to put a facility in Europe uh, when natural gas prices are going to be high, supplies are unstable and the like. Um, quote from Food Drink Europe, which is the large agribusiness food manufacturing industry group there. Uh, their executive director last week provided the quote, which I think is pretty Pretty poignant, which is no energy means no food. Um, so those were my comments. I've got a hard break, so I'm going to hand it over to Brian to to manage questions uh, for the rest of the webinar. Thanks everybody for joining, and we'll be back in a month. Um, with that, Brian, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Dave. So uh, Dave has to log off. So uh, we have some time for Ron or myself or Tim to field any questions. As I said, uh, Frayne had a, a previous engagement, so he's, he's uh, off, but you can contact him if you have any. So are there any questions? Well, while I'm waiting for uh, anyone to type any questions in the uh, uh, chat or question and answer that they might have, I can take this uh, a moment to uh, mention that we have a new member of our uh, Ag Business uh, and Applied Economics ex- Extension team. Uh, Dr. John Biermacher, I believe his title is Integrated Livestock Specialist, and he may be joining our uh, uh, monthly webinar series with uh, information that 
he, he will be presenting on the topics that he covers uh, within within extension as well. Um, and he's on here uh, kind of listening right now. But I just want to let you all know that, that that happened and he's here now on campus. And in the future, we um, we might be hearing from him on on these monthly webinars uh, also. Hopefully you're finding a lot of value in these in these monthly webinars that we're putting on. And uh, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for watching. And we'll uh, I guess see you next month. Mm -hmm.